Hello, my name is Dr. John Frost and today I'm going to talk to you about ascites. Uh, hopefully by the end of this presentation you'll feel much more confident when uh, faced with a patient who presents with uh, ascites and how to deal uh, with it and any complications as a result of it. Okay, so let's get started. So, what is ascites? Well, the term ascites is used uh, to describe the fluid that can accumulate within the peritoneal cavity. It can develop in response to multiple pathological processes, although the most common one is that of portal hypertension. Other mechanisms that you may be aware of are peritoneal inflammation from such things as uh, infections or malignancy, um, and also due to hypoalbuminemia and low plasma oncotic pressure, and damage or obstruction to the lymphatic circulation, uh, thereby impairing uh, reabsorption of this fluid. In the developed world, then portal hypertension secondary to cirrhosis or chronic liver disease will account for the majority of patients with developing ascites, with intra-abdominal malignancy and right-sided heart failure making most of the rest. Let's start by talking about the demographics of ascites. Patients can present with this problem all over the world, but obviously the cause will, dep will vary dependent on a geographical location. Those in Africa, parts of Asia and South America are much more likely, for example, to develop ascites due to cirrhosis through various infectious agents such as viral hepatitis B or possibly the parasite schistosomiasis. Whereas those in the Western world, the most uh, likely cause of ascites is that through cirrhosis through alcohol abuse. Similarly, those areas with a high prevalence of viral hepatitis are also at higher risk of hepatocellular carcinoma and therefore may develop a malignant ascites as a result of this. I think it's also important to remember that females can often have a degree of physiological ascites, approximately about 20 mils, dependent on what stage of menstruation they may be. Now obviously this will not be detectable clinically, but can sometimes be seen on imaging such as ultrasound, so it's important to consider that. Males will never have that amount of fluid there, and so if you see free fluid within the abdomen on an ultrasound scan, then it usually will almost represent a pathological process. It's important to note that ambulatory patients with an episode of cirrhotic ascites have a three-year mortality risk of about 50%. So this is a serious complication of cirrhotic liver disease. The pathogenesis of ascites is often dependent on its cause. And as you can see from the table in front of you, there are a large variety of disease processes that can lead to ascites. To try and make things a bit easier, you can classify them into those involving a healthy peritoneum, such as the various causes that produce portal hypertension or hypoalbuminemic states, or those that involve a diseased peritoneum, such as infections like bacterial peritonitis or tuberculous peritonitis, or malignancy, uh, such as advanced ovarian car carcinoma or peritoneal carcinomatosis. The largest cause of ascites in those patients with healthy peritoneum by far is that of portal hypertension. Let's look at the mechanism of portal hypertension producing ascites. These patients will often be peripherally vasodilated due to various circulating cytokines within the body. In addition, they have sequestration of fluid within the splanchnic vascular bed, and therefore the body is tricked into believing itself to be in a hypovolemic state. In order to counteract this, it will therefore activate the renin-angiotensin system, which leads to sodium and water retention in order to restore the body's fluid balance. This process occurs, but unfortunately the system is not switched off. Therefore, these patients often become hypervolemic and the excess sodium and water spills over into the peritoneal cavity as ascites. Spironolactone an aldosterone antagonist is therefore one of the mainstays of treatment in patients with portal hypertensive ascites as it directly targets the renin-angiotensin system uh, in order to switch it off thereby inhibiting the production of further fluid. 
You can see by the table that there are a large uh, number of disease processes that can cause portal hypertension. Obviously the most common being cirrhosis, uh, but other conditions can be uh, secondary to hepatic metastases, uh, hepatic congestion through bud chiari syndrome or right heart failure, and also conditions such as portal vein thrombosis and schistosomiasis. With regards to the disease peritoneum, uh, these are usually caused by uh, infections, as mentioned, and uh, cancers involving the peritoneum. Be wary, although hepatocellular carcinoma can lead to ascites uh, through a disease of the peritoneum, it can also lead to ascites uh, through the mechanism of portal hypertension, and therefore can be considered in, on both sides of the table. So how do these patients present? Well. The most common presenting complaint for those patients with ascites is probably that of abdominal distension and swelling. They will often notice that their abdominal girth becomes a lot larger, and sometimes they can present with problems uh, such as vomiting, particularly postprandially, or that of early satiety. If you suspect that your patient may be developing ascites, the first thing that you should do is take a focused clinical history in order to help you differentiate between the various causes. As mentioned previously, cirrhosis is the most common cause of ascites, and therefore you should ask for risk factors and symptoms of liver disease. For example, is their alcohol intake particularly high? Do they have any family history of liver disease? Do they have any risk factors for the acquisition of viral hepatitis? Other important things to consider are, are there any signs or symptoms to suggest malignancy? Have they been losing weight? Have they had any problems with their bowel habit recently? And it's also important to check for signs and symptoms of heart failure, as these three main causes are probably the most common conditions leading to the development of ascites. If you don't think it's due to one of these three, then the other things to consider are those of intra-abdominal infections, such as tuberculosis, or some of the more miscellaneous causes, such as pancreatic or chylus ascites. Following your history, the, first, the next thing you need to do is to examine your patient. To start with, it's always important to take a careful, generalised examination of the uh, looking for features uh, or stigmata of chronic liver disease, such as clubbing, spider nevi or leukonychia. Uh, is your patient jaundiced? Do they have any heart murmurs or a raised JVP that might be consistent with congestive cardiac failure? Or possibly, do they have signs of cachexia, weight loss and lymphadenopathy that might point towards a more malignant process? Following your general examination, the next step is to move on to the abdomen. As you can see from the diagram, there are a few features of portal hypertension to look out for. Often the patient will have a distended abdomen that is full of ascites, and this may present with either a fluid thrill on examination or through shifting dullness. They can often have splenomegaly as a consequence of portal hypertension, but this can sometimes be difficult to palpate due to the volume of ascites. On the surface of the abdomen, they can sometimes have caput medusae, dilated veins around the umbilicus, and will often have peripherally dilated veins uh, running alongside the flanks. These are all features of portal hypertension and suggest underlying ascites. Following your clinical history and examination, the next step uh, in the evaluation of a patient with ascites is your basic investigations. These will helpfully confirm the presence of ascites and also help differentiate the cause. To start with, let's talk about some of the general investigations that you can perform. Obviously, you want to get a panel of blood tests, including those looking at various causes of liver disease. Ultrasound scan, particularly with Doppler, is extremely useful to evaluate not only the presence of ascites, but will also look at the portal vein and hepatic veins, and for any clot within them. Sometimes, due to the volume of ascites and scarring within the liver, you might require a portal phase CT scan in order to truly evaluate the uh, hepatic vasculature. 
The chest x-ray is often useful as this will determine whether the heart size is particularly big, pointing towards congestive cardiac failure, and if so, then an echocardiogram might help to tell you whether there is significant right heart failure or constrictive pericarditis. Following your basic general investigations, we then need to look at getting a sample of ascites, and this is often done uh, through a technique called an acidic tap. Once you have your ascites, the first thing to do is to make a note of the colour. This is important, as it can often help tell you what the cause is. For example, a serous straw-like fluid often suggests ascites due to portal hypertension whereas a milky white coloured ascites might be a chylus ascites from obstruction to the lymphatic system and bloody ascites can often represent either malignancy or possibly a chronic pancreatitis. Following your initial macroscopic assessment it is important to send that fluid for various testing the first of which should always really be a white cell count and a microscopy for culture and sensitivity. If your white cell count exceeds more than 250 neutrophils, this is often suggestive of a bacterial infection that may cause the ascites or may be a consequence of it being there, and therefore it's always important to do. The next step is to consider sending it for protein, in particular albumin, for that enables you to calculate the serum to ascites albumin gradient, or SARG. This is important as a SARG of over 1.1 gram per deciliter or over 11 grams per litre suggests portal hypertension with more than 97% specificity and therefore will helpfully exclude other disease processes. You should always send it for cytology particularly if you suspect malignancy and then if you suspect a specific cause, such as pancreatitis or a chylosocytes, then specific investigations such as a pancreat uh, a acidic amylase or acidic triglyceride level are also often very helpful. Hopefully, with these investigations, you will be able to determine the exact cause of the ascites, and therefore this will obviously help tailor your appropriate management. The management of ascites will be cause specific. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to talk to you about the management of ascites secondary to cirrhosis and portal hypertension, as it's so important. These patients are often in a state of salt and water overload, so the first step in its management is to reduce the amount of dietary salt that they're taking. This, unfortunately, can sometimes be quite unpalatable, and therefore can sometimes be difficult to do. You can also restrict uh, the amount of fluids that they take in a similar way to that we do with patients with heart failure. However, it's important to consider their underlying renal function as sometimes this can just make the problem worse. The next step after dietary measures is to add in medicines such as diuretics, in particular spironolactone as it works very well against the renin-angiotensin system. They often start with 50 and usually 100 milligrams and then titrate up dependent on the response and the renal function. If they present to you with large volume ascites from the get-go it can sometimes take a while for those diuretics to kick in and therefore we often help start them along with paracentesis where we remove large volumes of the fluid through a drain. This can also be used for patients representing with this problem on a, a recurrent basis or in those patients that have diuretic resistant ascites. Diuretic resistant ascites uh, is unfortunately ascites that develops um, despite the use of diuretics or in those patients that can't take them due to underlying renal problems. This can be a particular problem as they are coming in frequently for large volume paracentesis. For certain selected patients, uh, for example those that have not had problems with hepatic encephalopathy before, you can consider doing a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt or TIPS procedure in which you bypass the liver therefore helpfully uh, shunting off a lot of that ascites. If they're not suitable for that, 
Some centres will still offer a possibility for surgical shunts, although these are largely out of fashion these days. And of course, for those selected patients, liver transplantation is obviously the ultimate cure. Complications of ascites are likely to be due to accumulation of the fluid itself or through its management with diuretics or uh, paracentesis. The first and most important complication to consider is that of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. This is when the fluid within the abdominal cavity spontaneously becomes infected through translocation of bacteria. It is a life-threatening complication and requires clinicians to have a high level of suspicion as it often presents insidiously. It often complicates cirrhotic ascites due to the low protein content as the bacteria within the fluid cannot be opsonized properly. Patients will often present with grumbling abdominal pain and may not have usual signs of infection such as fever or marked tachycardia. Therefore, I cannot stress enough how important it is to send all fluid away for a cell count and MCNS, as if this it complicates your patients with uh, ascites, it is a severely poor prognostic sign and must be treated aggressively. The next thing to consider is that of renal impairment. This can either be through the use of uh, diuretics, such as spironolactone or fruzamide, it can occur uh, through sepsis, such as those patients who have developed spontaneous bacterial peritonitis or other infections, or in some patients they can develop a hepatorenal syndrome, which carries a, a very poor prognosis indeed and is a sign of end-stage uh, liver failure. This is usually treated through plasma expansion, but if this does not work, other medications such as terlipressin may be used. Next thing to consider is that, uh, is that of visceral perforation through paracentesis. This is a well recognised complication and can occur and will result in bacterial peritonitis, sepsis, and ultimately death if not suspected at time of insertion. The way to try and avoid this is to always ensure you perform an acidic tap first, and if fluid is obtained easily, usually drainage will be safe to do so. The last thing to consider is that of pleural effusions. Due to the accumulation of fluid within the abdomen, some of this fluid can cross through fenestrations within the diaphragm into the thorax, resulting in what we call a hepatic hydrothorax. These can be bilateral but often present on the right hand side, and they can either be due to ascites itself or due to underlying pancreatic inflammations in, in patients with chronic pancreatitis or those with lymphatic obstruction and chylosocytes. These can often be very difficult to manage as drainage may provide a short term relief but unless you uh, counteract the main cause of the ascites they are likely to reoccur even with attempted pleuridesis. So, what key information do you need to take away about ascites? Well, number one, the commonest mechanism of ascites development is probably due to portal hypertension. And number two, portal hypertension is usually as a result of chronic liver disease and cirrhosis. It is important to remember, however, that intra-abdominal malignancy um, or hepatic congestion can also lead to portal hypertension. Number three, it often presents with abdominal distension or a feeling of bloating and is usually diagnosed through identifying shifting dullness um, with other indicators of portal hypertension uh, being quite useful as well. Once you've identified it there, investigations have to be targeted towards the cause. Although the most common is cirrhosis, don't just assume that, um, as there are other causes. Number five, management will often depend on the cause, but usually involves the use of diuretics such as spironolactone or paracentesis. And number six, you must have a high index of suspicion for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. It is a life-threatening complication of this problem. And actually, one patient having an episode of SBP uh, means that he has a 50% chance of dying within the next year. 
So I hope you found this talk useful. Um, I found the following resources quite helpful when coming up with this talk, and you can get these fairly easily uh, if you've got uh, the ability to get online. Um, E-medicine is a very useful uh, online uh, encyclopedia specifically around medicine, um, and uh, it's helpful on a number of medical topics, not just evaluation of SITs. Um, and then th this th other thing to consider is this uh, gastrohep.com, um, one of the e-books on there. The chapter 10 of Ascites uh, was really, really good, uh, and you can find it at the following link in PDF format.